I'm Andrew Oswald. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Warwick. Tonight we have a big event where we're going to discuss the state of modern society and what's been happening in the research area called the economics of happiness. I'm very glad to say I have two of the world's most famous experts in this area, both here today and for the event tonight. One is Professor Richard Easterlin from the University of Southern California and the other is Andrew Clark, a professor of economics at, at Paris. Both have long-standing Warwick links, and I'm going to ask Dick Easterlin to begin this discussion by telling us what the main punchline is likely to be from him tonight. Well, uh, in order to put it in the right context, uh, the issue is, uh, will economic growth improve happiness in poorer countries mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, first punchline is no. The evidence for that is mm -hmm. to the contrary. Uh, then the question becomes, well, if not economic growth, what will do it? Uh, and the punchline on that is public policy mm -hmm. and particularly social policies with respect to uh, uh, things important to people like uh, unemployment, sickness, uh, old age pensions. Uh, and the third uh, question then is, well, but can uh, the poorer countries afford uh, programs of that sort? And mm -hmm. to that end, I make a comparison with Germany, which was the pioneer in instituting programs of this sort. Three quarters of the world's uh, less developed country population lives in countries whose uh, GDP per capita is as high or higher than Germany's. About half of them live in uh, countries whose GDP per capita is twice as large as Germany's was when they instituted these programs. The bottom line is, uh, yes, uh, public policies uh, can uh, be afforded in poorer countries and if instituted they should raise happiness. Mm. Thank you for putting it so cogently. I, I can imagine, Dick, you would guess that um, a lot of people will find your conclusions radical if you're saying that even poorer countries uh, aren't going to become happier by becoming richer. You're famous around the world for having convinced a lot of people that's true of the rich countries. So for Britain and Germany today in the United States, we have many, many BMWs. And I think it's easier for people to understand that from this point, growth might not help us. But it will, your argument about much poorer countries, that would be viewed as really provocative. Yes, well, uh, there are several sets of evidence. One is uh, if you take a group of Latin American countries for which we have uh, data for about 12 years, uh, there's no evidence that the countries with higher rates of economic growth had any greater improvement, improvement in happiness than the countries with low rates of economic growth. Mm -hmm. uh, the same is true of uh, about 10 countries from uh, a different survey that actually covers a longer period of time, uh, scattered across three continents, Latin America, uh, Asia, and Africa. The most uh, striking piece of evidence, however, in my view, is uh, the experience of China, where uh, the GDP per capita has been doub doubling uh, in less than 10 years. This is a rate of economic growth that's totally unprecedented in, in any country's experience. Yeah. So, uh, over a period of 20 years, so that basically, you know, in uh, a fraction or a half of an adult lifetime, 20 years, uh, incomes are quadrupling. Uh, if there would be any place where you would expect happiness to be raised by yes. the sheer growth in material circumstances, China is it. And yet, uh, now I've looked at, I think, uh, five different surveys, four of them conducted by different survey organizations, you would think if growth were raising happiness, at least one of these would show some marked improvement, and none of them do. Yes. I do think this is extremely interesting and important evidence. Tonight, as you may know, I will talk about the neuroscience evidence, among other things. 
on how, as humans, we feel about income and how it's relative income that seems to trigger well-being inside our brain. So, in fact, the neuroscience evidence, if we think of humans as being the same all over the world, the rich countries and the poor countries, might well stack up rather nicely with your line of argument. I'd like to come back to that. Maybe I could ask Andrew Clark in this uh, seminar, giant seminar we're going to have on modern society and happiness, what he intends to say tonight. Just, um, just the gist of it, of course. Well, like many of us, I've been incredibly inspired by Dick Easterlin and this idea that increased income for everybody in the long run doesn't, or even in the medium run, doesn't lead to higher rates of well-being can be explained by comparisons. Comparisons of me to you, you to me, or just me getting used to my higher income. And I thought that's a very persuasive idea. What I wanted to do was take that idea and apply it to other aspects of modern life, modern society. And I'm particularly thinking of things like unemployment, uh, marital status, obesity, um, religion, things of this nature. And I want to ask questions like, do we get used to divorce? Does unemployment matter less if more people are unemployed around me? Or indeed, as, uh, say, a Catholic, am I happier in a Catholic-dominated area than in an area that's dominated by Protestants or like and the answers to these kinds of questions are to an extent mixed, but I think they come back to the policy ideas that Dick was putting forward here. We need to find some policy lever we can pull that will lead to a long-run and sustainable increase in well-being. So we need to find a domain of life or domains of life where comparisons and habituation are not predominant. And I would suggest one of those is unemployment, for example. Now, when you say habituation, I, I imagine that you mean the fact that if I get a pay rise from the university, I hope the vice chancellor's watching. I think you. Then I might get used to that, <laughs> and I might be enjoying it rather less five years afterwards than I do five weeks afterwards. That's right. That, and it's, it's an open question to what extent that, that habituation exists in humans. Could, could I could I just ask Dick yeah. on his? Uh, view on this, I'm sure you have more to say. One possible explanation for the Eastland paradox is habituation. Another is that we're constantly comparing ourselves to each other and all the tide of economic progress is lifting all the boats so we don't feel better off. May I ask what your instinct is about the relative importance of those habituation or compar sheer comparison effects? Sure. Uh, uh, so I think we're, you know, we all are uh, in agreement that uh, uh, these types of comparisons uh, are important yes. in, in affecting people's feelings of well-being. Uh, the habituation is a comparison with your own past experience yes. and uh, the other is a comparison with others' uh, experience. So you have social comparison and habituation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, <coughs> Uh, my own sense, and I think there's evidence to this effect, is that these types of comparisons are overwhelmingly important in uh, financial and material comparisons. That we have, uh, without any effort, uh, you know, a lot of knowledge about uh, the economic circumstances uh, of the people around us just by knowing what cars they drive, what kind of homes they live in, what neighborhoods they live in, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we know, uh, I think, quite a bit less about people's family circumstances. Mm -hmm. We're often shocked to find that, that, you know, a marriage is broken up, and here we thought this couple was uh, quite happily uh, uh, partnered. Uh, and the same is true in health. Uh, people don't uh, go around advertising their health problems. So uh, I think comparisons of the sort that are very important in the uh, pecuniary and material domain are much less important uh, in the family and health domains and that public policies in those areas can uh, uh, improve well-being over the long term whereas they tend to be self-defeating in the 
material realm, which is to say the realm of economic growth, which is yes. what tends to be popular. As uh, Andrew Clark is one of the world's experts on comparisons, I, I wonder, do you agree broadly with Dick here, or is there anything you'd like to say particularly about this idea of different domains, different aspects of my life? Well, I think the first thing to underscore here is just how little I think we know about many of these uh, domains, many of these different areas, even in developed countries. I'm always astonished to, to find this every time I look at the literature. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, for me to compare to you, you to compare to me, in some sense we need to be visible to each other. So I totally buy your point about conspicuous consumption. This is where it all comes from, this idea that I can mm -hmm. see what you're doing so I can place myself relative to you. Some of these non-pecuniary life domains do seem to exhibit social comparison as far as I can see. Um, certainly, I, I do now believe there's a comparison effect in unemployment, though how large that is remains to be established firmly, I believe. Could, could I chip in? Could you translate that into regular um, <laughs> English, <laughs> English, English language, just so for, for a non-specialist? Right. The, the idea here is that unemployment or always has a psychological cost. It always hurts you to be unemployed. Yes. That's, that's always true. But that degree of hurt seems to be smaller in high unemployment regions, okay. as if there were a stigma effect that came from comparing to people who are yes. dislike me. And right. of course, the more unemployed there are around them, the less that stigma is. I don't think it ever really goes away. Of course, that's why I think unemployment remains an important area for public policy. Um, so unemployment, yes, I do believe we compare. Funny you should say divorce, because I've just done some very recent work looking at the well-being of divorcees, and that does seem to respond to the regional divorce rate as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to divorce, do in a high divorce region, that would be my advice. <laughs> so once again, this is an example of yeah. Comparison effect is consistent. Is consistent. Those, that's right. And getting their norms partly from the other human beings around them. Yeah. So norms are, as the as the name suggests, they're contextual. Yes. They depend on what we see around us to some extent. So they and then again they're malleable. So they're open to policy um, to to being moved by policy, which is which is a good thing. Before we close, I'd be very interested to get your views on one topic, and that is. Why do you think these ideas, what we would now call the, the ideas from the economics of happiness, have taken so long to come to the front of public discussion and so long to get into economics courses at university? I think uh, one of the, uh, the, the big sources of resistance uh, has to do with the uh, uh, heritage of the economics profession, uh, the behaviorism uh, that we all were uh, indoctrinated with as uh, graduate students. Uh, it was put very succinctly by uh, a former president of the American uh, Economics Association who said uh, uh, economists are interested in, are not interested in what people say but what they do. And of course the happiness uh, uh, work was built entirely on what people say about uh, their feelings. And so uh, it's taken a long time uh, to sort of establish the authenticity uh, of what people say. If economists had paid more attention to psychologists who basically only listen to what people say, uh, I think the acceptance of uh, happiness economics would have been much, much quicker. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Thank you. I, I, I wanted you touched only briefly on your own work about uh, you know neurological uh, evidence and uh, yes. biological, and uh, I, I'd I'd like to get your feelings as to whether it could perhaps uh, clarify this issue of uh, the extent to which comparison exists uh, in these different domains of uh, people's lives. Yes. I think eventually the neuroscience evidence will be able to distinguish among how we compare in the uh, domain of income, in other words, in terms of our pay packets, 
compared to how we compare, say, how tall we are, how slim we are, or where people go on vacation, and many other things. Of course, we're still quite near the front of being able to do that in, in research. It's hard to imagine what 20 years or 50 years from now will look like. But I do think that the neuroscience evidence and some of the other uh, hard science research that's going on will, will really help the, the economists who work on happiness data because this is a way of showing uh, that there really are patterns lighting up in the brain in, in a, a way that corresponds to the assertions uh, critics would say of economists like us. So I think this is going to change the future of social science actually and eventually the whole future of public policy in our society. Perhaps I, I could uh, maybe... That's, that's, a, that's, that's a mild generalization. That's, uh, <laughs> maybe we, could, we could think about... Maybe we could think about closing. All I could say is I should live that long. <laughs> why? Yes, why, why, so why do you why, think why these ideas have taken take so long? I think the first general statement is it's hard to overemphasize how little integrated social science is. Mm. Um, in general, I know you're an exception, in general economists don't talk to psychologists and will try to avoid sociologists at any cost. And it's a bit of a caricature, but it is generally true, we don't talk to each other. Mm. And of course psychologists have had fantastic things to say about subjective well-being, perception and bias and all of these kinds of things for many, many, many tens of years, and we never listen to any of them. Having Danny Kahneman get the Nobel was a little bit of a help. It helped bring, thing, bring, thing, bring things a little bit closer together. What really helped for me, for, in the face of incredibly hostile seminar audiences that I'm sure you've both experienced as well, was bizarrely enough using what people say to predict in the future what they do. So having long-run panel data where I could take our responses in this room today and use them to predict who's going to quit their job, who's going to quit their spouse, and indeed how long we're all going to live, mm. has been, I think, my best friend in proving to people that what people say really is a, an echo of how well they are physiologically and psychologically doing. And that evidence has only come in in the past, well, 10 or 12 years, I would say, and of course, given the lag times, that's why it's yeah. taken us so long to go. Thank you, you've made me very happy, gentlemen, and uh, it's been a pleasure to discuss these topics. Thank you. Our pleasure, too.